I need a motion to adopt the minutes of the regular council meeting of September the 18th. Councillor Brothers, Councillor Souls, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Is there any business arising from that meeting of September the 18th? Uh, announcements are very brief today. All I, I want to just remind the community that Luna Fest is on this weekend. I know it was a, a spectacular event last year. A lot of people are looking forward to it. Just encourage the, everybody to uh, see what's on and uh, get out there and enjoy the festival. I think the uh, weather is going to be a little better this year than last year, hopefully. Uh, we have two delegations today. The first one is the Farwell Splash Park Society and uh, Pat, you are going to uh, do the presentation, both and Barb, Pat McKee, Barb Feynman. The floor is yours, ladies. Uh, hello, Council. Uh, Barb and I are here to update Council on uh, where the Splash Park is uh, financially and uh, uh, what's going on with us. Uh, I'm Pat McKee, the Chair. This is Barb Feynman, she's the Treasurer. Uh, Stacey Bresred is the sec Secretary. Uh, we are all volunteers and we have 18 members. Uh, we were formed in March of 2017 and uh, our project has a budget of $653,000 and 82. 653, and uh, last summer we raised, we had raised $51,000. That's what we had last summer. Um, in October 1st of this time last year, we had $201,000. So uh, right now, our co current total is $610,000. So um, our, our community has been very generous to us, and they have a solid belief in our project. Um, Splash Park has been recognized as the number one need by Parks and Recreation in Revelstoke. Uh, tourists. The tourist industry and businesses in town will also benefit from this. And uh, there's something tourists ask for that we don't offer right now. Uh, I'm just going to read you something from the uh, Council of Priorities for 2017 Quality of Life. The City of Revelstoke will emphasize quality of life issues, including social, active living, cultural experiences, and recreational experiences. So in our view, this, is, this project is where community, recreation, and history all come together because it's in Farwell where Revelstoke began. Uh, this project is good for all generations, for visitors and families and newcomers. So we gotta think we're covering a lot of bases there. Uh, I'll give you a little quick rundown on our major donors. They are the Revelstoke Community Foundation, the Columbia Basin Trust and Columbia Basin Trust Community Initiatives, Robustow Credit Union, Robustow Community Forest Corporation, and the City's Forest Corporation Legacy Fund, the Economic Opportunity Fund, Downey Timber, Best Western Robustow, Southern Interior Development Trust Initiative, Robustow Accommodation Association, uh, the Resort Municipality Initiative, and our families, businesses, individuals, and groups. So thank you to them. They brought us where we are right now. Uh, I would also like to refer to the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Master Plan. Uh, recommendation number 38, Tourism Strategies for Sports, Recreation, Heritage, and Culture. This kind of tells you um, that we are doing, we are following a city mandate. So we are trying to uh, give a gift to the City of Revelstoke that fulfills what the City of Revelstoke wants. Uh, Revelstoke has a natural setting that supports tourism and in turn, and that in turn supports economic development. People are looking at ways to minimize their spending. Recreation may be considered a non-essential and people with lower household incomes are less likely to participate in sport at a cost. Local implications are that Revelstoke encourages higher rates of participation by all demographics and our significant number of young families as well as a large senior population looking for low and no cost options in Revelstoke. So um, we're trying to have a facility that is valuable to all of these um, sectors. And the seniors are one of our strongest supporters because the seniors have memories of taking their kids to Farmall Park years ago. And they want to do that with their grandchildren now. So uh, that was important to us. 
Uh, as far as the fixture is concerned, we are going to have nine water features. There's going to be little things that burble up. There's going to be things that jump, and there's things where you can spray your buddy. So it's going to be fun. Uh, these features were not chosen by us. They were chosen at a public open house in February 2016. So we are fulfilling that need. So uh, we are trying to. We are merely fundraisers. We are trying to fulfill what the city, what the public and the city wants. Uh, so, our big ticket item is the state-of-the-art recirculating water filtration system. So we are going to have an in-ground filtration system that is uh, such as a swimming pool would have. So we're not just going to merely uh, pump and just dump water. We're going to recirculate the water. So that brings our costs, uh, just to get a little technical, a cubic meter of water costs to produce uh, is a dollar ten per cubic meter and 65 cents to dispose of. So, but if we reuse the water, our costs for water alone per year or per season will go down from four thousand, a minimum of four thousand dollars, down to less than fifty dollars. So, although it's a, an expensive facility to build, it's cheap to run. It's going to be maintained by the city of Revelstoke, and they have uh, qualified personnel in place, and they, they will be taking care of it after we gift it to the city. Uh, this water filtration system is important. It is required by our donors. So for Columbia Basin Trust has a water smart program, they insist on water conservation. And water conservation is a big deal, and going forward, uh, we want to be a leader. Rumstoke is going to be a leader in this. We're going to be one of the one or two communities in the province to have this type of system. And we are going to be compl complying with Rumstoke's open hose bylaws. So you just can't let our hose run. And the other benefit to this is that we are never going to be high and dry <coughs> and non-functional during any water restriction or on your your uh, odd or even days. We, we're trying to comply with that bylaw as well. So the fixture itself will have a lifespan of 25 to 30 years. That's how that's long these things last. Uh, a lot of communities are refurbing their 30 year old ones. So we're, we're coming in, in late uh, for splash parks. However, as far as our system, we will be a leader in the province. Um, right now we have competition from other uh, communities. Uh, Lumbee has a splash park, Chase got a splash park this year, uh, Salmon Arm has two. In Salmon Arm, if you go to the one that's just up from the Canadian Tire near the rodeo grounds, they had to change their traffic patterns to accommodate the number of people going to that splash park. And they have a, a, a nice uh, playground there too. So uh, Golden has one. So when a family is planning their trip, they may bypass Revelstoke because all the young mothers know where splash parks are. And uh, so they, we, we might be losing out in that regard. So we want to address that as well for our businesses. Um, we want to create an authentic tourism experience. So when you're a tourist, a lot of times you go to a town and you don't talk to anybody else except, or see anybody else except other tourists. So we want our tourists and our locals to be able to mingle. Uh, the two best examples of that right now are Grizzly Plaza, the music, and on the gondola. So we want newcomers to meet their neighbors and lose a sense of isolation. And we want uh, a tourist to come into town and be near a senior that grew up in Rumstow, that sort of thing. So that's a real authentic thing that people look for when they're traveling. Uh, the other thing is accessibility. This uh, fixture will be accessible. It's a flat area. So anybody who has any mobility issues will be able to just go right in and, and uh, if you look at our picture there, you can see that there's a little guy going in on his wheelchair. A little to the left, there's a grandparent with a, a little baby. So we are uh, very much stressing that this is all generation, all ability, all gender. Uh, there's nobody who can't use this fixture and we welcome everybody to do that. Uh, if you are feeling hot one day, you just go down there and cool off and take whoever with you. Uh, if you if, Which happens to me quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and if you, you know, and when you think about it, we do have a, a, a place where you can cool off 
just outside of town, Williamson's Lake. It is six kilometers out of town with a steep access, and a lot of grandparents don't and can't go there, or people with mobility issues. So that's the advantage. Uh, our location is central. Columbia Park is there, Baguette is there, the rest of Rebels are there, and we wanted this uh, facility to, we're happy this facility is going to be a stroller, stroller to push away for most people. So, uh, our groundbreaking is going to be May 6th. We picked this uh, date with uh, Lori from Parks and Rec, and I have to thank Lori and Cindy Floyd for helping us so much. Uh, Cindy helped us with the tech stuff. Uh, applying for grants is, is uh, a whole education for me, and uh, it, it's, it, sometimes it's challenging. So uh, Cindy was great, but our main contact has been with Lori. We try to uh, use as little time as, of her time as possible, but any time we had a question, uh, she's just been terrific. So thanks a lot, Lori. The groundbreaking is, we chose May 6th just because uh, this spring, we had a late spring and there was a lot of snow. With any luck, we might start a little earlier. We are going to carry on um, fundraising uh, because we're not there yet. Uh, we're at 610 and we need 653. Um, there's, there's a few approvals and uh, if anybody has questions about approvals, uh, Lori could address that. Uh, Barb's as, as a treasurer, she is, in charge of the financials, so if anybody has any questions, uh, just so everybody knows, council got a package on the financials, I believe. So if there's anything in there you want to ask Barb. Uh, so we're here today to bring council up to date with our progress and to respectfully request that the City of Revelstoke contribute in-kind services. So these would be in the form of normal operations, materials and equipment that the city has provided to other recreational facilities within the cities. Um, and this would be uh, things like landscaping, site servicing, gravel, uh, prep. So we are committed to ensuring that the Farwell Splash Park Society contributes to attracting and retaining families and employees by supporting the most critical reason we all want to live in and visit here, and that's our quality of life. Uh, thank you for your consideration, and we encourage your participation in creating a wonderful facility for Revelstoke. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question that I have before we let you guys go is, uh, you mentioned this in kind, and I'm, I'm under the impression that uh, engineers are, are looking at the site and, and the facilities, what needs to be done, and they're going to be compiling a, a list through you, Lori, of possible in-kind that the city could be looking at, and, and, uh, and I think uh, Pat mentioned uh, you know, landscaping and gravel and, and uh, some equipment time, things that we would do as normal operations for uh, whatever facilities that we're building or, or repairing. So that report is going to be coming, that request, the in-kind uh, request is going to be coming through you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll put that together once I receive the design drawings. Um, we currently have a, a draft version that's circulating through the city right now for review. So once I get comments back to the engineers, we will follow up with them on what's required. Okay. Council Brothers. A couple of things. First of all, a great, great project, people. I mean, it's really fantastic for this community. And, and the fact that you got it done so quickly is wonderful. You know, always need a champion for these things. And obviously, you guys are the champions. But a um, couple of questions. When we when when you're given the in kind stuff, does that bring you up to the level that you need, or do you still need more contributions? We're going to carry on fundraising regardless. We are the fundraisers. Uh, the the splash park is going to trigger an improvement in the Farwell Park, so there's going to be better washrooms, walkways. Uh, we when you look at our picture, let's see if it comes back. Out. But the in kind. We'll finish the 653. I think that's what the that, question. That, that's what the that's question. question, and the yeah. answer is yes, it will. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. And and the second question, and when I was walking by there the other day, I was just wondering, are we going to be able to keep the, the the jungle gym there and everything else? Is it going to stay in the same spot, or will it move? Yeah. Um, we're the fundraiser, so that yeah. will be it'll still be there. there. It will still be there. Yes. One, of, I think that one of the things that we would be going through budget processes is that because there's going to be uh, a whole bunch of, of work and improvements in the park, we're going to be looking at internally uh, updating washrooms and things like that to make the park more uh, uh, accessible and, and, and 
to fit in with all the improvements that are going on, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Did you have anything, you're good. Did you have anything else you do want to add to that about it before well, I... I was just going to add that this is actually a picture, a rendering from the supplier, which is RecTech. Um, we've chosen RecTech as a supplier because uh, they provide better servicing after purchase. Uh, it will be circular and uh, there's a, a large spray area around the outside. Uh, I've talked to Corey Brokosh of... Uh, Valley Blacktop. Valley Blacktop. And he is, says uh, that he's going to give us a really beautiful product. The blue color that you see there is not typical of most flash parks. And that, so that's an added thing that we are hoping to have uh, enough funds to, to uh, have that. Right now, that is not in the budget. So we're, we're going to carry on. And uh, we have, you know, I get stopped all the time on the street. And people will say, where can I donate? And, and that happens quite a bit. So... You know, there's sort of like a little bit of a wish list. We chose a circular shape because we thought it was more welcoming for people to look in. Um, one of the main reasons we're doing this too is for, um, when you go into Farwell Park, it's an enclosed space. So a parent can sit with their friend, have a coffee that they picked up at Tim Hortons or McDonald's, and sit and their kids can run and play and they can they can enjoy themselves as well. Uh, we want a place where people can throw a blanket down and have an affordable birthday party. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's so much more than just the fixture that it is. Uh, any more questions from council? Okay, well I just want to say that uh, having uh, lived and slept in an eight splash park for the last year and a half. You guys have done an, an amazing job, uh, and, and uh, I think that this is going to be an amenity that the community is really going to embrace. I, I know uh, lots of people are talking about it. The fundraising is now is basically there. The project is going to be happening, and uh, no, it's uh, it's going to be a nice addition to the community. And, and good on you guys for uh, stepping up to the plate, and uh, and the rest of your committee for uh, following through and uh, making this thing become a reality. And uh, just one last thing, uh, Pat, is that you know when you're in this room, you have to call me your worship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, your worship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, th thanks again for coming and uh, good presentation. That was the Thank first you. and last time. Yeah, you're yeah. done. <laughs> 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 That's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, our next uh, delegation. Missed that. Gary I know my business. I'm going to have to make another donation to this blast party. Uh, Jill Zacharias is going to give us a, a year end report on the social development coordinator position. Well, while well, that's getting going, I'd just like to say good afternoon and thank you for having me today. You've got your year, my year-end report in, in your meeting package, so today I'd just like to share a few highlights. And the first thing that I wanted to point out is that this spring marked the 10th anniversary of the City's Social Development Committee, and in July, 10 years of social development coordination. And uh, as you know, I've been social development coordinator for the whole time, and it's been both uh, extremely challenging and extremely rewarding at the same time. So, uh, this is, it's, it's happening. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, just essential to the position is staying in touch with the sector, attending meetings, being part of strategic planning processes, ongoing dialogue with sector representatives, <coughs> excuse me, really listening to what's going on in the committee, in, in the community, and then taking that overarching knowledge and making it as useful as possible. I constantly strive to bring people and organizations together and uh, to develop systems that perpetrate uh, organizations working better together to mitigate uh, social issues. New this year was starting to work on housing. Up until this year, housing has not been part of my work plan. Um, 
that it was added primarily because without a doubt, housing along the full uh, housing continuum from emergency housing right to um, market options is uh, definitely the biggest social and economic issue. Um, it was also an attempt to bring additional resources to the policy work that needs to be done at the municipal level. Poverty uh, reduction or affordability, mental health and substance use, and remaining a diverse and inclusive community, these are all high social priorities that I've been working on this year. What is not on this list are things that I uh, support regularly but are not such a big part of my work plan, like age-friendly community planning, uh, the Early Childhood Development Committee, Seniors Association Youth Initiative, and um, other priorities. So for poverty reduction, uh, the big news is that last fall I was able to acquire three years of funding uh, from the Vancouver Foundation. So this is about $150,000 spread out over three years. Um, to support the work that we're doing towards our 10 overarching goals in the strategy. So 90,000 of, of this uh, goes to three community groups, um, $10,000 each per year, so $30,000, uh, to the local food initiative, the community literacy table, and the early childhood development committee. So that just is adding capacity in that regard. Uh, the other, uh, within this piece, uh, it also, the funding also adds 20 hours a month to my work plan for three years, which enhances my ability to work on housing, which, as you know, is super time consuming, as well as enables me to take the time needed to coordinate our local group and conduct evaluation and support a variety of projects. Within this piece, it also supports uh, work that I do at a higher level. Um, uh, such as chairing Tamarack's BC Community Practice and participating in regional initiatives and speaking in other places and stuff like that. One, uh, last March, uh, I facilitated local input to the Provincial Poverty Reduction Strategy. Um, and the year before, I faci we facilitated input here to the Federal Strategy, which was just released. So there's lots happening at the higher level. One project was to coordinate the uh, State of Poverty in Revelstoke and Area Report, uh, which provides a snapshot of, on the State of Poverty as well as look at trends over time. So we now have data on the same indicators from 2000 to 2015, so we've got 15 years of trend data. We found that while the number of low-income families in our community has increased with time, the percentage has remained fairly constant, so at about 17% of our total population. For all family types, median income is actually going up, but it's going up at a greater degree for higher income households than for very low income households. Um, the median income of men in, in Relstoke is consistently <coughs> higher than provincial averages, but for women it's lower, and so women, uh, consistently remain uh, at about 60% of, of that of men. So with the rising cost of living, this means that low-income households will be working harder to make ends meet, uh, as is indicated in the increase in those experiencing poor housing need, as well as the number of working poor. We also looked at what I call indicators of deep poverty. Uh, and found that there are consistently between 200 and 250 individuals in our community over time that experience deep poverty in Revelstoke. And in April, I updated our living wage or cost of living analysis, which remains the fourth uh, highest in the province. So generally, these indicators of poverty, working poverty, uh, and deep poverty are useful for understanding the changing dynamics in Revelstoke. Um, as well as the impacts of policy changes at hard, uh, from higher levels of government and can aid in developing strategies for both reducing poverty and improving affordability in our community. Um, the Poverty Reduction Working Group continues to be super engaged and dynamic and I'd like to uh, thank Gary Seltz for recently stepping up as chair of that group. So for housing this year, uh, I completed the needs assessment portion of the Housing Society's um, application to the CBT BC Housing 
uh, RFP to build 21 affordable rental housing units. And as you know, this application is successful, so that's great. I've spent a lot of time trying to work with people and organizations uh, to deliver some sort of emergency shelter uh, response in Revelstoke. So today I just had another meeting. Nanette Drobot came in from Peachland. Don Dunlap came from, from CMHA, came in from Salmon Arm. And we met once again with key sta stakeholders and there's so much opportunity to move forward right now. It's actually really exciting. Uh, the funding opportunities coming down the pipe from BC Housing are literally unprecedented for 30 years. So the key here is that both the federal and provincial governments have heard loud and clear that homelessness and affordable housing are issues across the country. They're listening and now is, is a time of opportunity for communities. We just need to be ready and to have the capacity to move forward and capture these opportunities as they arise. So that's the tricky part, having capacity. So my goal is if, is if one organization doesn't have the capacity, we bring people together and organizations together so together we can build that capacity. So I also reviewed and provided input to the city needs assessment, the housing data for the RMR master plan update, um, and the DCC bylaw, super happy with no increase in uh, the charges for secondary suites, um, the 100% reduction for nonprofit uh, housing developments, the 40% reduction in DCCs for development of for profit affordable housing. Um, all of these are, are very progressive, and I'd like to, you know, obviously, it would be great to see them remain in the next iteration of the DCC bylaw. So, uh, for mental health and substance use, again, the big news here is that I was able to build on past three years of shared care BC funding, which ended last December, and acquire two more years of funding to sustain the Child and Youth Mental Health and Substance Use Collaborative through to the end of 2019. So this time under the school district's umbrella. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the impacts of the Child and Youth Mental Health and, and Substance Use Collaborative. They really have been far-reaching. So primarily, we're seeing uh, an active building and deepening of relationships between service providers. And then, between service providers and physicians, which, is, which has been pretty amazing. Service providers and organizations now have even more of a regular presence in the schools, supporting youth in everything from healthy relationships to mental health awareness and management. For one half day a week, um, physicians come to RSS to do a clinic. Like this is, this is really phenomenal, decreasing barriers. And the kids that they're seeing are primarily uh, for mental health, which is really super positive. Um, as Jody Wallach from RSS said at our meeting this month, this is enabling them all to, to work more effectively, and it has increased RSS's ability to bring community members into the classroom as well. Very, very positive. Um, and our project lead, Stacey Byrne, has been doing an amazing job raising awareness in the community. So this is something that has been on our to-do list for a while. So I also, last November, administered the youth, uh, Revelstoke Youth Drug Survey at RSS for the third time. So now we've got data from 2009, 2013, and now 2017. And this time I worked with a local designer to, to, to build these infographics. Um, again, this data really helps us target our efforts as well as engage and communicate with parents, service providers, SD19 staff, and the youth themselves. This year, the, really, the big things that really popped out for me and well, from all of us were the, obviously the continued prevalence of alcohol use uh, and the onset of vaping, which is a big, uh, big thing that we're having to deal with, um, which appears to have led to an increase in tobacco use, which is super unfortunate. And as well, we're also seeing um, an, an increase in cannabis use. And youth have told us that the pending legalization of cannabis is confusing for them. They're, they're receiving mixed messages. So, you know, the kind of recent cannabis survey where public health education came out as such a strong public priority, 
is totally reinforced by the youth themselves. So the key here is getting good, concrete information to the youth and enable them to con uh, make the best decision decisions and just know what's going on. Uh, the good news is that over time we've seen slight increases in the age of first use, which is really good, and decreases in most behaviors that increase risk of harm as well as problems caused. Um, parent engagement definitely continues to be our biggest challenge. Uh, so another priority uh, that uh, a project that emerged from the collaborative but also crosses over into the poverty reduction work, uh, you know, in terms of increasing access to resources is the co-development of the revelstokelife.ca website. So this project is in partnership with the Rural and Remote Division of Family Practice, the Child and Youth Mental Health LAT, and the Revelstoke Women's Shelter, and, and myself. So managing this site uh, will replace existing projects that I have, like the Directory of Social Services and uh, the Welcome, the Revelstoke Newcomers Guide. Um, so the goal is to have an easy uh, to navigate one-stop shop for all health and social services in the community. So basically within one or two clicks, you're, you're where you want to be. Um, and we hope to launch the site in late October. So last year uh, was the sixth annual Welcome Week, connecting newcomers in the community, and once again, it was a great week. Um, I do this in partnership with many, many organizations and businesses in the community. Um, and I'd really like to thank City Council for providing free public transit for the week last year, and the year before that, and that, and that. And today, in your meeting packages, is the same request for this year's uh, Welcome Week. And I thank you uh, for your consideration. With Welcome Week, I always get such positive feedback. The goal, uh, you know what Pat was really talking about, the goal is to increase people's sense of belonging and engagement in the community. And as Welcome Week continues to build, moment, build momentum, we uh, continue to go in the, in the right direction. So uh, the last thing I wanted to highlight was that uh, last spring I was invited to Langley to do a series of presentations as part of the kickoff for their social sustainability strategy as part of this uh, public panel um, and also did presentations on social sustainability to senior township staff as well as the Fraser Valley Healthier Community Partnership Table. So it was really super interesting to be part of the beginning of their process there. Um, particularly as we move into the upcoming OCP review, uh, it really made me put my thoughts together on what constitutes social sustainability. Um, and, you know, for me, it really kind of comes down to I think we all have the same vision. We all, all want good quality of life. We all want vibrant, healthy, and safe communities. But we find ourselves in an increasingly complex society. Um, and social issues like affordable housing are, are highly complex. Uh, can constantly evolving, and as I've talked about, necessities that we all work together. But in order to do all of that, we need healthy individual capacity, we need healthy organizational capacity, and we need, and that contributes to healthy overall community capacity. And this, and we need strong networks and interconnectedness. Um, or our ability to respond to change and remain a vibrant community can be compromised. So I've come to see social sustainability as foundational, um, the prerequisite really to the healthy function of our community. <coughs> so for just in conclusion, for Revelstoke looking forward, social priorities are intertwined with economic priorities. Affordability, housing, remaining diverse, inclusive, family-friendly community are all at the forefront. What's really been coming up lately in terms of community conversations with service providers is um, Greyhound, the, clo the pending closure of Greyhound. Um, and uh, so these are all things that we need to figure out, work together as a whole community. There's opportunities to come together and work with higher levels of government like never before, as well as the private sector to find solutions that work for rent. So, um, yeah. Hopefully this, some of this can be addressed through the development of the housing strategy as well as the renewal of the OCP. 
which I see as an opportunity to uh, really bring innovative social and uh, environmental solutions and uh, right at the forefront of development as we move through growth and change. And I will continue to do my best to assist in any way that I can. Thanks, Joe. Uh, questions or comments from Council? Councilor Nixon. Uh, I'm just really glad to hear you mention the Greyhound issue because I think that's a really pressing issue that yeah. really needs uh, good heads to get together and come up with a plan because I think uh, we're going to lose a lot of people out of our community if they have to move to the crowd and just to be functional, that they have choices about where they travel to. Well, and what repeatedly comes up is that people get stuck here. You know, uh, the women's shelter is seriously concerned. Um, the victim services, you know, people have car accidents on the highway. They're, they land in Revelstoke, they have nothing, and they need to, to get back home. They have the resources, but they just need to get back home. And so, you know, we're quite concerned that it's going to increase risk, right? Like, risk of harm, like hitchhiking, stuff like that. Any other comments or questions from Council? Joe, I want to thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, it was, you, you mentioned that it's the uh, 10th anniversary of the position, and, and I was actually sitting at this table 10 years ago when the position was created. And, and uh, we created it because of <coughs> social implications of changing into a resort community. We knew there was going to be lots of changes in the town, and we wanted to be ahead of the game. And I know you have a, a, a whole bunch of stakeholders sitting around in your committee that, that work for uh, different uh, community organizations or businesses or, or whatever and they're all concerned about uh, the social impacts in the, in the community and when you start going through all the list you, you start realizing all the things that are going on that, that impacts certain people in, in the community and it's always the same or different people but regardless there is social impacts and, and you start realizing with all the different programs and all the issues that we're dealing with just how important social development is in the community and, and and this is what we have to do at this table is we have to think about every aspect of the community and not just the the real vocal ones or the ones that are in your face or the ones that are the flavor of the day but it's the whole community and that's what we're trying to represent around the table so thank you for your presentation and, and keep up the good work thanks, thanks Joe. thank you <laughs> Okay, so we're moving into uh, 11A, and we are going to have a presentation, uh, Mr. Sturgeon. On, this is on development uh, permit application for 1750 Trans Canada Highway Can West Hotel. And just to let Council know, we do have uh, some of the proponents in, in the room Paul and Billy, and is it Aaron? site um, surrounding uses of course we've got the railway uh, south of it the Ramada has been built on the western half uh, over here undeveloped lands and on the freeway to the north of course um, this project is uh, over 4,500 square meters so it requires Ministry of Transportation approval uh, we've dealt with that through the application process so it won't be uh, concerned but just as a note that's why that recommendation is there for you 
Uh, there's an aerial of the site that does not show the Ramada Hotel, which is over here. Too much coffee today. Uh, zoning is CD09 that was adopted in 2007. It has a range of auto oriented uses car rentals, banks, liquor stores, offices, restaurants, hotels, a few others. Um, surrounding lands are also zoned CD09 down here. And here as well, M3 refers to the uh, railway. Which is Can somebody remind me to fix the batteries in these so that I don't have to do this? Please. No, they're just temperamental. Um, highway commercial is our OCP designation that aligns with the zoning. Uh, and our DP area is scenic corridor. The intent of the scenic corridor is to project a quality, high quality image for the city to reflect our downtown character, which is our heritage character, uh, to minimize impacts to surrounding uses. Um, we do that through DPs with uh, shielding, lighting, landscaping, uh, building massing scale. Uh, it also uh, allows us to address parking design, functionality, and pedestrian access, and landscaping, as I mentioned. There's the view from the highway. Again, it doesn't show the Ramada, but that is right over here. And the view from Victoria Road, so the development will be roughly right here. Another view from Victoria there, so we're looking at this site here. That's our site plan for the area. Uh, we've gone through quite a few revisions with the applicant, and I want to thank them while they're here for that. Um, there were some discussions around turning movements on site, there was discussions around landscaping, there was discussions around building placement, view corridors, building design. We've gone through several conversations through this. Uh, all with the intention to meet those DP guidelines. I'll go through that briefly. Um, just in terms of vehicle access, we've got one access that will come off the Bend Road, and then we've got a new access that will be shared with the Ramada Hotel on this site. In total, there's 116 parking stalls here. Uh, the hotel requires, uh, per the bylaw, 0.9 per room, so roughly 80. Uh, this building over here is a future CRU unit that includes, uh, at this point, they're tentatively saying two units. Uh, one of them, the, the site design is to accommodate the drive through drive throughs are permitted in the zone. Uh, that would need to go through a separate development permit application, but it would be much more straightforward <coughs> given that the site layout is already determined. Uh, parking demand for that would be in the range of 15 to 30 stalls, depending on whether it was a restaurant or a retail use or a drive through Those things aren't set in stone right now. Uh, so all in all, they've got plenty of parking on site. There's also uh, parking on site here and the ability for the two to share between. Given that there's similar uses, that's not an issue. Um, servicing will still need to be done along Bend Road. Uh, that includes construction of the road itself along with curb gutter sidewalk uh, and infrastructure that will be done through concurrent subdivision application and through building permit. The hotel itself, um, that's probably fairly difficult to read, but it includes a small restaurant, or sorry, small uh, buffet area, which is oriented towards guests, as well as fitness. There's a hot tub outside. Uh, it's, these are not public facilities that are more oriented towards guest use. Um, it include a floor plan for the second story here, but it's fairly standard hotel fare. Uh, this is going to be a first for Revelstoke. Uh, it's modular construction, but it's using concrete panels that are precast, off-site, shipped to the site, and assembled. Um, it's similar in concept to what you would see for like a tilt-up warehouse, if anyone's ever seen that, where they form the panels and then tilt them up. Just in this case, the panels are made in another location and brought here. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch go up. Um, building materials include mostly concrete with a variety of finishes. Uh, one of them is a preformed wood look, one of them is an exposed aggregate, and one of them is a smooth concrete. Um, these pictures I just wanted to show you so you can get a sense of the variety of colors, and the colors also re reference different materials, but the better view is, uh, sorry, I'll back up to that. There's a 3D rendering of the front and 3D rendering of the back. This is the exposed aggregate section here. This is uh, a wood look, we're calling it a form liner, and these are smooth concrete finishes. Uh, going back here, this is what the, the wood looks like. It's kind of interesting. It's cast in concrete to look like wood and then painted. 
And this is the exposed aggregate, which is similar to what you'd see on a sidewalk, but it's ground smooth. So give you that rock look. Sorry. Um, lastly, port cochere. That'll be cultured stone, metal trim on the roof, and then some metal accents throughout the building, uh, some levers, aluminum windows. We did express some concern with the applicant on the rear of the building. I detailed that in my report. Um, they've advised us that the Marriott brand standards are to have this kind of sleek, modern look. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we're certainly not calling it ugly. We, we expressed concern that it was out of character with Revelstoke. Um, I've gone through this before where, where corporate branding is, is very strict and difficult. Um, you know, as a planner, you're often the lone voice in the wilderness. Um, I certainly wasn't prepared to recommend against council approving it, but I did want to raise it as a conversation to be had, and it's at your discretion whether or not you would like to discuss that more. They did provide some examples of other buildings that were built, uh, which show that it, this is not um, this is not a low cost construction method by any means. Like the, the I, I don't believe the uh, the design to be one of cost savings is more one of design. Um, this is kind of what you would expect to see here with the smooth concrete in the windows, and there's the, the sort of wood look. Uh, we we did ask for some wood trim like this, but again, that was a, a branding issue, is what we were advised. So um, it's it's really up to council on that one. But there's another zoom in. So it, it, it is a it is an interesting building material that, that will look good. Uh, there's some examples of some other construction that this company has done. So. Um, that's all the comments I have on it. I'm happy to answer any questions. I want to get a motion on the floor first and then uh, let's see if council has any comments or questions. And a uh, little bit out of the, the ordinary but because the proponents are here if uh, council wishes to ask them for any comments or you want to ask any questions, I, I'm sure that they are extremely amenable to that. So we have a uh, recommended motion if somebody's prepared. Councilor Duke. Okay. For your worship, that the application for DP 2018-05 be approved. Second by Councilor Nixon. Uh, okay. 348 p.m. Anybody? <laughs> Comments or questions? I I, uh, I I don't mind starting off. I think that this is a uh, a uh, real cool looking building. I, I like the, uh, the the different concrete uh, textures and applications. Um, I know that uh, staff have uh, spent quite a bit of time going back and forth with the proponents. There's some comments from APC that uh, the proponents have have looked at and uh, incorporated some of those ideas. I think that there may be even uh, opportunities to to talk about some more of them, but I think that this is going to be a, a great addition to the community. And, and uh, for so many years, uh, we we've had a highways maintenance yard up there, or we've had nothing up there, and I think at the at the detriment to uh, the community as as far as having a uh, warm, welcoming, inviting feeling to the entrance to the community. So having this, uh, this, this next hotel, and, and, uh, and I, I think it's gonna be a restaurant, but I'm not sure what the, the retail unit is going to be. But uh, I, I just see this as, as, again, being a better invitation to the traveling public to pull off the highway. You look at the at the design, and you look at the uh, the, the branding and uh, the materials. I think that people driving by are going to look at it and say, "This looks like a uh, a, a good place to stay. It looks like a, a quality uh, place." And those people are going to hopefully uh, come off the highway and spend more time in into the community and get introduced to what I call the more heritage downtown rather than uh, the highway so I think this fits in good with uh, what people expect when they're traveling on the highway and uh, I'm encouraging council to uh, vote in favor council brothers and just a couple of questions I understood that, that to to sort of remedy the concern about the you know the look from Victoria there's going to be some trees or some yes yeah uh, the PowerPoint stalled on me and that was my cue and I apologize but uh, there's the landscaping plan um, there's an extensive, extensive amount of landscaping on this site. They've done a perimeter of low shrubs around the outside, and then along the back side of the hotel, there's two-inch caliper trees, which are probably going to be 
around that height. Um, I know that they don't want them to grow too high because it'll block the views from the rooms, but it'll provide some shielding across the back and break it up. There's also some grass, uh, wild grass, wildflowers planting along the embankment that slopes down towards CP. So if I go back to um, uh, the way we incorporate the files, it slows this thing down. If I go back to the street view, um, it's a little hard to predict, but you will be able to see the, uh, the wildflower, wild grass. Paul, I don't know if you have any more details on that. For the back, um, there it is. So that'll show up on this embankment here, and then along the top of it would be the trees and then the hotel from there. So second question, do, are we building the, or are they building the, 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 the commercial unit at the same time, or is that going to be done later? And, and if so, do we have some, I, we, I guess we have no idea what's going to be there? The second building? In the commercial building, the yeah. 5,000 square feet? No, it would be under a separate development permit. So, so it's being built at a later date? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Councilor Nixon. Uh, I really like the look of the hotel with it having sort of the wood concrete look. That's something that, you know, in BC, which I really promote is that wood, using wood. But what about the portico? Is that going to be good for snow load? Is that... That'd be a building code issue. Okay. Yeah. Just because it's spooky, I just <coughs> see snow flying up. Yeah, I, I imagine it's probably steel construction under that, and okay. it will have to be engineered okay. to be snow load. I don't think there's going to be an issue about snow load with the Porcashire. Okay. It will have to be... Yeah. Built to withstand whatever is going to be thrown out. Okay. I just want to get that Comments or questions? Councillor Orlando. Yeah, Your Worship, uh, um, this is uh, leading to a question, but one, one of the things I want to point out to Council is that uh, we've given some direction to staff that when we have you know a big development or development application coming forward and there's a bit of a hang up with the last little details like you know they're 95 percent there and there's a few issues that are causing things to drag out that this council is comfortable with t you know taking uh, that last five percent and making a, a decision on those things and it's uh in the effort to you know better expedite things and get get, get the ball rolling uh, uh more quickly so I do want to draw attention to a couple things that uh, Mr. Sturgeon has mentioned in his presentation are also contained in the report. Um, and and uh, his worship also mentioned this earlier that you know, there were concerns from the APC um, um, about uh, sort of form and character issues. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I think the central sort of uh, uh, hold up here is, you know, the this uh, company wanting to maintain its brand and have a certain type of look, a hotel, a look of a hotel, like a modern look, and um, Revelstoke having, you know, the, shooting for more of like a mountain town kind of look, and, and how do we go over those problems uh, and come to a solution. In the uh, report it mentioned, um, it mentions uh, that council, if they see fit and agree, um, the building's character could be better adapted to Revelstoke's character. Council may elect to refer the application back to staff for specific further improvements that are in line with the above guidelines, and that's including feedback from the APC. So my question of staff is, you know, really what we're dealing with, I think, in my mind, is just the last little details, like the trim, and maybe we could, you know, shoot for a little bit better on some of the aesthetic things too better uh, satisfy some of the wording that's in, um, in our guidelines and as well as the input from the APC. Um, and my question is, is options moving forward for that? If, if council so wished to um, say, well, let's just try and make this, you know, a little bit more closer to us or let's, you know, provide some uh, authority to planning staff to, to work towards these changes. Um, how do we go about doing that in a way that will keep everything rolling, won't cause, you know, the significant delays and allow these people to get on with the project? It would need to be specific feedback. So if there was something in particular that you as a group um, wanted to see, mm -hmm. um, then uh, you, could, you could include that in your recommendation. You could just simply work with them to do something to that degree. Mm -hmm. um, the, the guidelines that I'm providing with NROCP are there in front of you. And so, you know, for, for me to delay an application working with an applicant over something that maybe we're not speaking the same language on because their idea of integrating is different than mine, then it's beyond our capability to work with that, right? So if council has 
and, and it's not you know for me to make up the design of the community, right? Mm -hmm. We work with the tools we have. So if council had a particular component that they wanted to see, then I would suggest that as a group you uh, land on that and make that recommendation. Otherwise, I'm not going to stand here and, and make um, offer suggestions because I don't. Well, that's my that my own use of suggestions because I I have been uh, somewhat involved in in, in in being in the middle of this thing and having uh, talks and looking at designs and, and following this thing along for for quite some time. And I and I, I can tell you is that first of all, looking at the design, the, the different textures, the different colors, the, the way that the building goes up and down and in and out. I'm actually quite happy with the, the basic design of the building. Now, one of the comments was about window trim, and I'm not a designer, architect. I, I know what I like and I know what I don't like. I'm concerned about designing by committee, and, and I don't think that's the, the way to be going. I would like to see us move forward with the approval but I also would like to have staff talk with the proponents to say, you know, we're, we're a wood community and, and we're in the middle of it. Is there opportunities where we can do some embellishments and, and bring some of that natural wood in to kind of, uh, I won't say counterbalance the concrete, but to add the elements of what the area is famous for. And I'm, I'm under the impression talking with the proponents that, that they're amenable to talking about things like that. So I don't know, I'm not sure if anybody, uh, if Paul or Billy, you guys want to have any comment about that while we're right here, but uh, it's up to you guys. But I, I think that uh, I think that would be a nice touch to put in, but I sure as heck don't want this uh, going back to the drawing board and and uh, and having all kinds of issues to to talk about. Daniel, that's your worship. If um, if council was to make a resolution to that effect about adding window trim and you made it specific then we wouldn't have to delete the process anymore. We'd amend the draft. Well, I, mean, I guess I was actually more referring to wood embellishments like the pork share and, and things like that is where I would rather be seeing something. I don't want to get into uh, doing a major design change on a building that is designed by, by the, the hotel chain and telling them that you people don't know what you're doing and uh, we can do it better. Uh, I think adding some, some to the entrance and the pork share. Uh, if we could get some wood elements in there, I would be happy with that. Is, but I sure as heck don't want to start looking at the, the whole mass of the building. Quite frankly, I think I, I actually quite like the building the way that, that it's done, the different textures and the, the things like that. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, just for us, we're obviously happy to work with features and adding them to the surroundings. I mean, again, our, you know, our priority is to have a beautiful building and have guests have a great experience, right? So by all means, are we hearing things, but we're stuck and uh, you know having people have ideas on what they want on the ground right and, and again from a development standpoint all I can suggest is you know there's a motif that's put in place for the city of Revelstoke so that when a development comes forth it has very clear guidelines on what you guys need and what you expect so that we don't have these back and forth between development and council and everybody gets to save their time because if we came into the table and you said you want 20% rock X amount of timber this shaped roof then went on the front side and we go and deal with Marriott then we tell them if they want to come to the table that that's what we have to provide right as opposed to down the road after everything's been approved from a huge corporation and takes them six months, takes you guys ten months, and now we're back to the drawing table going and asking them for a change that hasn't uh, you know, been identified on the front side. <clears throat> so how are you guys feeling if, uh, if we were to be talking about some wood elements and say the entrance, pork share, things like that? Um, just uh, to respond to that, my name is Billy. Thank you for your, um, for your time, uh, Council. I appreciate it. Um, I, I have a good relationship with Marriott and I'm going to go back to them and really try and um, look at some sort of wood feature for the porcache mm -hmm. um, and maybe like a trellis in the back that's something that could go where there's a nice sitting area there and you're in the hot tub area um, so that we can bring some of those elements. I did have this discussion with our representative Lance with Marriott in the last couple of weeks and uh, he said if, if, if that's something that you guys really want to push on um, then you know they're hopeful that they can make some movements towards that the biggest thing um, is the building itself and their design if you take a look at their prototype that is going to be really hard for us to go to the table with them but i think we could with the pork and to add some wood around the outside i think that could be doable 
So I, I guess uh, we have a motion on the floor. If uh, somebody wants to uh, put an amendment that uh, talks about uh, adding uh, wood elements uh, in conjunction with uh, Marriott and uh, and planning something, I'm, is that? All right. We're just dealing with the motion to approve the application first. The next one is yes. Yes. to approve all of the issues. Okay. That's where you need okay. Amendment. So with, so then we're just talking about the motion to uh, uh, approve the application. Any other comments? All those in favor? Motion's carried. And then we have a second one. I'll move forward. The file issuance of DP 2018-505 is subject to the following. Receipt of financial security in the amount of $111,823.76 for landscape works as specified in the attached draft development permit. Approval by the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure and completion of a subdivision application to the satisfaction of the approving officer. You want to put in D while you're right there, and then we can sure. figure it out fast on your feet. The addition of wood features in was it Parkashay? Yeah. And uh, if possible. Is there a seconder for that motion, Councillor Nixon? Did you get all that reason? Uh, just going to mention the other part was a, a trellis in the back in the hot tub area just to, to break up some of the exterior facade. Um, I got some minor concern about this process we're going down and I think Daniel and the applicant identified it clearly that it's the lack of detail in the development permit area guidelines that lead us to doing things that seem arbitrary or inconsistent with neighborhood feel and there's a significant opportunity going forward when the OCP is updated to make those improvements. And Mr. Tooch properly notes that major corporations can amend their design if the outcomes and, and the expectations of a community are clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen it done in Fernie with Canadian mm -hmm. Tire, Best Western, Tim Hortons, McDonald's. Mm -hmm. They all say, no, that's what we built. Well, no, it isn't what you have to build. And if a community has clearly articulated a design bent, then it can do that. Now, my concern with the amendment is not wanting to have to require this application to come back to council because in a development permit you're, you're commenting on form, character, mass, siting, access, site circulation, finished materials. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what we're going to do at a staff level is we're going to consider these amendments if they come forward and are offered by the applicant as a minor development permit application we'll just approve that at the staff level as opposed to require this to return to council again so because it's a, a minor improvement or minor application then we're moving forward and the next processes of building permit are not being held up that's all in progress so yeah, we're trying to get everything going concurrently here all right yeah. okay. okay comments or questions on the motion and i, and I guess what i I'd just like to make comments is that I, I'm, I'm in favor of the building, and I just think that any embellishments that we can put in to reflect the, the wood community that we are is just going to make it better, and I have all the confidence in uh, developers as well as uh, staff to come up with something that is going to enhance what's already a good-looking building, and uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned about it coming back to this table because I think that any other changes are going to be better. Uh, Councilor Duke. I just want to reiterate, I do not want it coming back to this table. <laughs> well, chances are you won't be here. Well, for the next guys. Councillor Lando. Uh, yeah, Your Worship, I just had a clarification question for Mr. Chabot. Um, so you were a bit concerned about the, the, the additional amendment that was there. So, And just to clarify, are you, are you okay with it moving forward the way it is? I just wanted council to know that we're going to deal with that at the staff level and I'm going to consider that council's delegated authority for Daniel to exercise his discretion mm -hmm. as to what's an acceptable amendment to the application. Mm -hmm. yeah. Daniel? Mr. Sturgeon. We have limits to the local government act regarding delegation and delegation. So council can't delegate me that authority. Or they can't, or council can't delegate now on the authority to delegate to me to make a decision, so we do it in separate application. That's what it is. It's just a minor application for a minor DP that the staff approved at the staff level. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to delegate myself for this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Okay
<laughs> and just to follow on that question, so it sounds like there's been some conversation of, among staff, the proponents and council that we sort of have an understanding of just we're asking for just a little bit more, do some tweaks, and, and if it, this motion pre as presented goes forward, we're going to be able to achieve that. And we're talking yeah. Port yeah. Cachere, yeah. entrance, and trolley in the back. back. Yeah. Okay. Really just a question. I noticed in your, in your report, Daniel, that you say staff requested a concept plan for this area to assist, but it wasn't provided. Is there anything that council has to do to, to, to assist you with that, or is that something that staff does? And how, how does that work? It's, it's something that we do to um, try to help the applicants um, to make sure that they're not, you know, it, like it's the development approvals process is kind of a back and forth. Oh, did you notice this? Did you notice that? And then, you know, we go in. No. So, um, in my experience doing this, um, if you ask for a concept plan, it encourages everyone to think ahead to the future. Um, there is potential for those lands down there. We don't know what it is. Uh, it's nice to be able to say to council, here's what the concept is. Um, I don't think the intent here is to hold up the application. So there, there's opportunities for parking and servicing down there. I think my comment came across a little bit more harsh than I intended it to be. It was that we don't, it, I meant to say that we don't know what's gonna happen down there. But I think that one of the underlying themes of, of particularly this development and other ones is the, the need to have updated design guidelines or stronger design guidelines. And, and I, I still think that highway design guidelines should be different than downtown heritage design guidelines. And I think we have to be careful that we don't mix those up too much. But the fact is, is that the, with this development going forward, we are going to have a, a better presence on the highway, a more inviting presence for the community, and the whole community is going to benefit from this added development that's going to be going on. So I, I'm looking forward to the, this product being built and, and uh, again, giving people on the Trans-Canada Highway another reason to be pulling off and, and uh, spending their hard-earned money in Revelstoke. And, and then they can go visit the Splash Park. Okay. Any, any other uh, comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sturgeon. So we are moving into, I guess uh, you're just staying right there. Yeah. We're moving into uh, uh, 11B, which is a development variance permit uh, for 1893 Echo Place. And you are going to do us a, give us a presentation. for 1893 Echo Place. Um, there's the, the rough location over there at Columbia Park north of the highway. A um, little bit of a zoom in so we know where we're talking. Uh, there's our zoning. This is currently zoned R3. Uh, there's some parklands surrounding it, zoned institutional. And then we've got the cemeteries over here. Uh, and there's an aerial showing that. So it's a nice little secluded pocket of town. Um, it's a very small lot, 300 square meters, 12 by 25 meters, that's 3,200 square feet. Uh, it has a land use contract over it, as well as the R3 zoning. Um, what the applicant is proposing to do is, is to build an addition in the back right here. Um, there's our house. It, just to make this easier, um, the land use contract was done in 1976, circa and land use contracts were an old form of doing zoning. It's basically contract zoning where um, lands were rezoned on a very site-specific basis and it was kind of a tinkering with the bylaws at the time. Um, at the same time, the city had a, a, what was called R3 zoning in place. That zoning was, was a single-family type zoning. When we adopted a new zoning bylaw in 84, we came up with a new R3 zone. But our new R3 zone was intended to be multifamily. So someone at the time said, oh, R3 is R3. Well, the old R3 zone had a setback of 1.5 meters. The new R3 zone has a setback of 3 meters. So it didn't fit with what existed at the time. So this gentleman has wanted to build an addition to his house in the back here just for a second family room. He's looking for a variance to allow a two-foot encroachment of here's his existing house, here's his carport and a two-foot encroachment right up here. The, the zoning is out of place. It's inconsistent with the lot. Uh, three meter wide setbacks on each side would more or less sterilize the lot. You'd have to build a skinny home on it. So we've happily recommended that council approve this two-foot variance. 
Councilor, move this motion. The bill variance permit application number DVP 2018-05 from Brenda Jody Lowndes be approved. And, uh, and that council gave notice their intention to consider the issuance of bill variance permit number DVP 2018-05 for 1893 Echo Place to vary the following section of the zoning bylaw number 1264 to reduce minimum side yard setback in section 7.5.16. Three meters to 2.28 meters. Motion by Councillor Duke, seconded by Councillor Sauls. And discussion on the motion. Councillor Brothers. Just out of curiosity, um, it looks like it's a little self contained unit. Um, does it have a kitchen and everything too? No. Okay. So it's not it's not like a vacation rental or something like that. No, and that kind of stuff will be addressed through the building permit if we catch something that's not supposed to be there. We'll deal with it at the time. But it's actually quite a small space. It's about 200 square feet. So. Great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sturgeon. Thank you. Uh, we are on to item C, which is uh, Welcome Week. Mr. Brothers. Um, the provisions of quick transit service during the period November 4 to December 1, 2018, as a means of promoting the transit service to newcomers, be approved, and that $350 be allocated from the Council Contingency Fund to the transit budget to offset the loss of fair revenue to the transit service during Welcome Week. Motion by Councilor Brothers, seconded by Councilor Sells. Discussion on the motion. Glad to see this thing coming forward. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Item D. Your Worship, I'll bring that forward. Uh, engineering at Paladin Crossing LTD be awarded the unit price contract for the old Snow Water Main project based on the negotiated proposal price of one million six hundred. Is it one million? Six hundred and sixteen thousand six hundred ninety dollars thirteen cents, excluding GST. And that authorization be given to staff to manage a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar contract contingency based on project conditions during the drilling and pipe installation. And our authorization be given to staff to procure contracts for ancillary works such as engineering, pipe tie, site restorations, and fusion of the pipe product to a maximum of 380000 excluding GST. Motion by Councillor Sells, seconded by Councillor Brothers. Discussion on the motion. <clears throat> Councillor Sells. Your Worship, this is for uh, something we've been dealing with since we started four years ago, is trying to get this uh, crossing done. It seems like every time we discuss it, the price goes up. So finally, we've got to a point where we're going to see this get done at what we thought was a, is a lot larger than what we were hoping for. But and, and did we have a, uh, a grant of 972000 Yes. Or this is no. Yeah. So now's the time. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> yeah, uh, this is a core services issue, a uh, health and safety issue. Uh, also, um, in my mind, you know, something that uh, was likely or uh, it's established fact that it's predicated by like a washout and some sort of issues that we're dealing with. It's something that we're uh, forced uh, to deal with, and uh, it is, uh, you know. Uh, horizontal drilling thing it's a complex thing uh, that we need to and uh, it's, it's an example of the kind of you know cost pressures that we face as we uh, um, are you know maintaining our core duties to uh, provide you know essential services like a water supply to the community but I believe um, uh, Mr. Tom, this is increasing water supply too yes you want to, yeah. this is uh, this is increasing the diameter of the pipe across the Lucilla River to uh, allow for future growth in the in uh, the Arrow Heights area. Yeah. And this yeah. was on the original uh, development cost charge bylaw. Yes. It was in the updated development cost charge bylaw that was defeated. Yep. So and now we are moving forward because I, I think that there's a time frame on on the uh, on the grant that you get that if we aren't doing the project, we run the risk of losing the grant. Yes, you wish. We've already extended the grant once, um, so I think uh, it would be it, it would be difficult to um, request another extension of the, the grant money from the province. They like to see the money getting spent, and uh, I think we've given them good reasons for why we haven't spent the money because of the various procurement issues that we've had. Now that we've been able to negotiate a, uh, a price with with a qualified. Um, Proponent, I think this is the time to, to get this work done. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the motion? 
All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Uh, moving into uh, communications, we have a uh, letter from, uh, I think it's Robert Wright, regarding uh, Nickel Road sidewalk extension. Uh, Councilor Nixon. Uh, can we just refer this back to staff to uh, work on uh, what the plan is for that sidewalk? Uh, this letter here looks very complex, and I think our engineer has some ideas to uh, look at a simpler plan. Okay, motion to refer to staff. Uh, motion by Councillor Nixon, seconded by Councillor Brothers. Discussion on the motion. Uh, I know that years ago uh, we talked at this table about the importance of sidewalks, especially when it comes to the, the, the common routes that uh, children are using going to school, and this would fit right in there. I think this is a project that uh, should have been done a long time ago, has to get done, and I'm encouraging staff and the next council to ensure that this uh, that this does get done because the the road is getting a lot busier and it's even more reasons on why we need to get the this sidewalk put in. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Questions for media? Yes. What? Yeah. Woo. What's up? What do you have, Jocelyn? I'm wondering if there's any discussion about staff accommodation at the new hotel. I just asked him, and he said that they purchased two properties in town. I know that uh, it's on their radar. They're they're having trouble with the uh, Ramada fulfilling the staff, and uh, they ha are kicking around some ideas. It is not a requirement from uh, from the city, but uh, I think that as we keep evolving into the direction that the community is going. It's going to be an issue that's going to be more and more in the forefront. And I know some of the bigger resort communities do require uh, to prove staff housing when, de when new development comes in. And, uh, but that is not a requirement yet at, in this community. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, we prefer a motion pursuant to Section 9.1 to the community charter to go in camera. Uh, Orlando Sauls, all in favor, motion's carried. Take a uh, three-minute break and then